and welcome back. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our first segment. We have with us a Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries Group. We have with us Amanda Acosta, who's the Executive Director of Audubon Society. And we have Alyssa Carnegie, who's the Communication Director for Oceana Belize. And we also have with us, we have from the Belize Federation of Fishers, whose representative is also on the this Coalition for Sustainable Fishes, we have Dale Fairweather. Good morning, guys. Good morning. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so the conversation for today is, is talking about uh, the use of gill nets. Mm -hmm. And we know that the, the coalition has been advocating for a ban of gill net, gill net uh, fishing in Belize. Um, there is a, a period open um, by the government for people to submit their recommendations and comments and whatnot. Um, and that deadline is this Friday, which is why this conversation is so pertinent for today. But let's step back and talk about why the coalition decided that gillnet use was a priority issue for sustainable fishing. Who wants to start? Well, I, I could start. Yeah. From a fisherman perspective, the gill net has been used for so many years and till now it's getting to the point where it's not sustainable anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the fishermen go out to sea and sometimes out of four days, the only one good catch they catch in their net. Mm -hmm. And they have seen that change due to the influx of our neighbors who have been coming across the border and using gill net in our waters. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time the Belizean fishermen only use gill net seas now. They don't use it all year wrong like our neighbors. So and the problem is not our gill nets, it's the intruders, Guatemalans. It's, it's, a, it's a combination, yeah. right? It's a com Be because the, the influx is so great now that it's, it's hampering our local fishermen. So you identify it as the influx of persons coming over. That, it, it's it's not that our- It's not just the influx, local it's also the way they use their gear. Yeah. But they you're saying that our local fishermen are responsible in the way that they use their gill nets. But a, the problem is... A lot the, of them, not all, but The majority. Lot. Yeah. But the problem is the foreigners or the persons who are trespassing and they come and abuse our system. Yeah. So it could be helped by policing. But well, that's uh, the big problem. I mean, if you can't even police right here in the city, how are you going to police out there? <laughs> well, just to give you yeah, some so context. Sorry, Mr. Fairweather, I was just going to say, just to give you some context, like for Oceana, I think this issue has taken on a life that has been very much associated with Oceana and our work in Belize. We've, this year is going to make 10 years that Oceana is in Belize. And just to give you some historical context, in 1997, a group of fishers from PG had actually put together a petition. I think it was, I want to say almost 200 person signed that petition in 1997. I mean, if you do the math, that's way before Oceana even came into Belize, that fishers, local fishers were advocating for the removal of this gear because they saw the impact, the destructiveness of it. Um, and they realized that they wanted a more sustainable fishery because they depend on it. Um, and so that was one of the things in terms of the work that uh, we're looking at in terms of sustainable fisheries is really looking at the gear, the gear use. And as Mr. Fairweather said, you know, what are some of those issues? Is it like the monitoring? Is it the enforcement? Um, and it's really interesting because, I, you know, under the Freedom of Information Act, Oceana just recently, um, in partnership with the Coalition for Sustainable Fisheries, put together a request to find out, you know, well, how many people are licensed to yeah. fish with gill nets. And I think we've ascertained that it's been, I think, 83 persons okay. who have been found here, at least locally. Because you do have to, be to doing register. It. By yeah. Theoretic by law. Law. Theoretically, yeah. you should. I think, yeah, I mean, you should register your nets. Um, what, what the other thing that we found out, too, was that although we have 83 fishers, I mean, we had a lot of, a lot more nets than should have been um, allowed, you know, were, in essence, allowed and, and legal. Um, but that's one of the things that's really difficult is that we've had, you know, species like the sawfish that's been, you know, kind of, not kind of has significantly mm -hmm. declined. I think people almost want to say in this part of the world extinct due to gillnet use. Um, regionally, we're seeing impacts that gillnets have, especially on uh, species like the vaquita. Um, 
and that would tell the purpose okay. yes in mexico uh similar to a dolphin i think their species numbers have gone down from 600 to 10 um in a very very um small time mm -hmm. but just looking at some of the experiences we've seen the impact as well as here locally we've had a lot of uh, photographic reports as well as scientific reports. A lot of research has been done on this issue. But it's a compound issue. Mm -hmm. So we, we want to make that clear. The, the fact of it is that we are advocating for sustainable yes. fisheries because as we move on and as climate change and weather variability become issues and, and fishing becomes more difficult yeah. because it is a, you're going for limited resources at this point. We know that there's almost 3,000 fishermen in mm -hmm. this country and for us to tell you less than a hundred so less than a third have gill nets. Um, the reality of the situation is though that it's a compounded problem. Mm -hmm. We're finding that it's not only those who have gill nets and use them mm -hmm. properly, we have people who are illegally using them, illegally placing them because there are regulations as to where you should put mm -hmm. gill nets mm -hmm. if you are using them. You shouldn't be <coughs> at river mouths, you shouldn't be within certain distance mm -hmm. of the coastal line and we know that that is not the case and so yeah. enforcement does have a lot to do with it. Um, but as we have had this conversation, I think we've had some really good outputs. For instance, Coast Guard is, is, mm -hmm. is an entity that we know um, we can start having more dialogue with. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me just get a bit of yeah. an understanding here um, from the fisherman's perspective. Why is it appealing to use gillnet as your, as your uh, well, primary fishing gear? Well, from like a sustainable sun point, mm -hmm. when you use a gillnet, if there's a school of fish coming, you would catch the entire school. Mm -hmm. So you, do you know you there would so it's be less effort, maximum um, yield, uh, yield, maximum yeah. yield, and then the fact is there's none left to spawn to keep on going for that school. Mm -hmm. So and if you keep using the gillnet after a while, you get to the point where it'd be unsustainable mm -hmm. because you would catch the entire school. Usually the fish swim in a school. Mm -hmm. And they have one fish that leads that school. Once that fish hit that net, the whole school will hit the net and you would kill that entire population. And for fish. any individual fisherman, that's a great catch for the day. Yes. Now, why does it then venture into becoming a problem? Well, well, we could mm -hmm. well I, I think the problem is the fact that right now it's getting to the point where you can't even find a school of fish to catch. So, that, I mean, our fishermen have been telling us that they go out and one time out of the week they might do good, but the rest of the time they can't even pay their gas bill. Now, the issue, the issue of policing, uh, which you identify as the major problem, is a combination of issues, but one of the major issues you say is the lack of, the problems, challenges with policing. Um, how do you respond to somebody who says, listen, we might be practicing sustainable fishing, we might have sustainable fishing practices in Belize, but we're just watering the grass so that the cow from the other neighbor mm -hmm. can come and yeah. eat it. Um, and that what we really should do is to focus on the mechanisms that are in place to see if they will work. Because even if we were to ban gillnets and our neighbors are still trespassing and using our waters, we're pretty much going to have the same problem and there's just going to be more stock for them to take. Well, I, I mean How do we respond well, to that? I, I think it would be more easier to, to enforce mm -hmm. a ban than to try and enforce good practices. Mm -hmm. Because one, the gillnet would be an illegal gear, so you were not supposed to have it, none at all. The coast guard and everybody can just stop you from taking it away. But if you allow the gillnet to remain, then it's used primarily at night. That's one of the things. Who is going to be out there at night knowing where you're going to set your net? Now with technology, these guys are going out with GPS. They're sitting on the reef. They're sitting in no fishing zones. They're doing all kind of things that's not, not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Are we having the same enforcement in relation to the foreigners? Well, in their country, they don't have enforcement on gillnet. They can set indiscriminately. That's why their era has been so d disseminated. No, I, I think what Kevin is getting at, and it's because we have documented a video of Guatemalans using gillnets in the South, and that might be the first example that comes to mind for people. Um, but I always think of fishers as not having passports and they're moving around. Yeah. Um, 
But what we've done in Belize in terms of trying to maintain and, and regrow our own fish stocks, how successful have we been? Because if we ban gill nets and we no longer have this threat to some of the junior fish, um, will we be able to, to see a replenishment of sort or a healthier fish stock as a result? Or is it simply maintaining what we have now? I think the, the fish stock would increase. Mm -hmm. The thing is about gillnet, it's, it's indiscriminate. So it's catching fish at all sizes yeah. and it's catching illegal fish as well. And if you're having it placed for long amounts of hours, then mm -hmm. it's, it's basically anything that gets caught is going to get killed. Yeah. Um, that's the reality. And so we might have, for instance, permit Dambone fish protected because of its value for fly fishing. But if a net is placed, they don't know to avoid it. Yeah. So the reality is, is that it's affecting, it affects everything yeah. and it's indiscriminate. And that's the concern that if we can at least reduce one form of impact, reduce one yeah. kind of threat, if you'd want to call it that, yeah. then you can, you can have a bit of hope. And yes, there is um, a lot of things happening and there's a lot of conversations that we could have in regards to the entire fisheries yeah. but it's it is exactly that it's it's the hope that if you if you move and kind of we have a checklist of things that we have to do to kind of make ourselves resilient yeah. as as a country and and as an industry you don't want to see the collapse of of yeah. anything i think that's important too just to come back to the point you were making earlier in terms of are we nurturing our resources just so other people could take advantage of it? But I mean, we've had conversations with some of the fishers who basically, I mean, they've said very emotionally and, and rightly so, you know, they have nowhere else to go. I mean, a lot of these other fishers can go back to their other countries, find other places, but if we decimate our fishing stocks and, you know, our resources, where are our fishers gonna go? What are they gonna do? You know, this idea of we race to the bottom, so let's take what's there so no one else gets it helps no one. And I think that's ultimately what we have to recognize is that if this is something that we really want to do and something we want to continue doing, then what do we need to do to make sure that that happens? Yeah. Now, Dale, you represent uh, the Federation of Fishers, and you said you're also a part of the mm. uh, Bili cooperative. Bili no, the, I'm a member of the National Cooperative, but also and a member of the Belize City Central Fishermen Association. Okay. Now we know that there are some fishermen who have come out in opposition of the complete ban. What they're saying is that the regulations that exist are enough. Tell me uh, from a collective standpoint, you, your friends, and the other people that you know, mm -hmm. um, where is the general thinking in terms of whether or not this is the right decision for Belize? Well, to me, I think that the guys that use Gilnet, the fishermen, they will, they will not want to, anybody will not want to, you know, destroy their income, mm. right? But, you know, you have to look for the, the greater good yeah. for the whole country. You know, so I mean, one time ago, you could go right to Bird's Island, you could fill your boat with mackerel and hook and line. Mm. But because of the gillnet, there's no more mackerel there. I but mean, you're not allowed to put gillnets at the river mouth. No, 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 no. But you could have catch mackerel with hook and line okay. and full your boat right at Verzile. Now, with only 83 registered fishermen, what's been the outreach in trying to uh, work along with them one on one? I mean, it's well, not a, such a large group that, that you can't get that individual outreach. Yeah, but well, I, I've seen that list and I've seen that there are names on that list that I know have license for Gilnet mm -hmm. that are not on that list, mm -hmm. that 83 list. So I think it's not a real representation rep yeah so so and i think you were alluding to it that there's a lot of things to talk about in terms of the fisheries industry and the problems that we and challenges that we're having in that industry my question is a simple one are we scapegoating gillnets because you say that part of the problem is that people who ought not to even have gillnets have it that they're not yeah. even following the law what would happen if we actually stuck to the letter of the law would that make a significant shift in the problems that we are having in the fishing industry? And are we well, simply, as I'm asking I, again, I, are we simply scapegoating gillnets? It's a buzzword. Everybody can jump behind. Well, we can make that the bad guy, but, but there are other problems that we're having. There, there is other problems. I mean, like, everybody knows that the NASA group has been, you know, they said it's, it's being depleted. Yes. They just this year, because of lack of enforcement, 
a population was decimated by fishermen at night, I think it was at Glover's Reef. Yeah. And that's only a three month period. Mm -hmm. If you can't even pollute three months, how are you going to pollute the whole air? Yeah. And that's looking at the enforcement challenges Shall and understanding that it's not just one threat that we're currently right. trying to, to look at. Yeah. Um, and it's not something that we have from the outside been looking in. You know, the enforcement agencies have been saying it. They've been looking at it um, because the policy, the, letter, the legislation as it stands in terms of patrolling gillnets requires a lot of effort. I mean, gillnets have to be tagged. They have to be put a certain way, uh, spaced out in a certain way, set in certain areas. So certain it requires size. a lot of discretion. Mm -hmm. Um, calling back and forth and that's where I think going back to what Mr. Fairweather said is that ultimately a phase out that would lead to a ban ultimately helps in terms of making sure with monitoring and enforcement and in general fisheries um, is is increased and you yeah. can put your limited resources where they need to be because that is ultimately um, an issue I mean you know as a lawyer I think you you can appreciate too that in the enforcement agencies are stretched across a multitude of issues. Um, Why you say as a lawyer? Really looking <laughs> 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 well, no, I mean, but just really looking at, um, you know, where the challenges are and what we so need to prioritize. So you feel like they could focus on some of the more priority areas if they're not well, removing a gillnet I mean, from the river mouth. Yeah, I mean, right now, I understand that at the end of this month, yeah. they're going to close the conch season, which is three months early, because mm. there's no conchs. I mean, there's nobody out there to stop the fishermen from taking the undersized conch. So the population has gone down significantly. So and but that's me, but enforcement fall, issue. Conchs are not a threat for the gillnet. So what you're pointing out is that there are policing problems, which it's is huge. Which is huge. Major, yeah. major. So what I hear mm. and, and I know um, has been a big part of the conversation is the gillnet use is not just talking about looking at depleting stocks. Um, fish stocks. It's also about what it's not supposed to catch that it catches. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda, tell us a bit about what we have seen. Um, and I know that, that the conservation societies are very much research driven. Um, what have we seen um, suffering the consequences of the use of gillnets that concerns you? Well, I think there's, <laughs> there's a few things. So for instance, the, the fact that we mentioned it's indiscriminate and we know that for instance, our turtle populations mm -hmm. are staggering. Turtles are very prone to get trapped in these nets um, in that they, they tend to swim in their pattern and you get caught in it. Yeah. The, the other thing is, is that we have issues of fin fish. Um, we were talking a, a bit off camera. Fin fish is at a premium price right now and fin fish is very desired by the restaurant industry in Belize. I mean, if you come to the Caribbean, you want to eat fish. And the reality is, is that we know that the fishermen are struggling to provide enough fish, fish. for the restaurants. And so that has, we could attribute it to a growth in tourism and that's all fine. But the, the reality of the situation is that we are struggling. We are importing fish into this country yes. to, to be able to meet our needs. And not um, just any fish. I no. keep on saying that. No. It's yeah. cat fish. <laughs> cat fish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because of price again. Because. Yes. You, you have to realize importing into this country is, is costly and so it's what yeah. you can what you can feed the masses with is what's going to get imported. But yeah. the the reality of it is is that the science is showing that we are having issues in terms of numbers. The, sh the science has shown that the, the net and the gear is indiscriminate. And, and I think the reality is, is we understand that this is people's livelihoods. Yeah. And we are saying that, that even if there is a ban as the end goal, there will be a phasing process. And that is the conversation exactly. that should be happening <coughs> at fisheries as far as I understand at the task force where they're talking about what is the time frame and we don't want a 10 year time frame. What yeah. is the time frame and how are we going to prepare these fishermen? How are we going to start transitioning them to more sustainable gear, to better gear, to, yeah. to, yeah. to yeah. sustain a livelihood? Because the reality is if this is bread and butter for almost 3000 exactly. people, it is a valid conversation Absolutely. that we are having. Yeah. And we are saying that the good cannot be suffering for the bad, that yeah. we have to look at holistically what will help their industry to have these sustainability factors that it can. And I, and I can't help but stressing the reality of it is the weather is becoming more yeah. unpredictable. Exactly. The fact that a fisherman, and I can tell you um, in Lighthouse Reef where we work, 
fishermen will say, well, I couldn't come because we had too much cold front this time or we had weird weather mm -hmm. and they're not going to cross from Turnef to Lighthouse when it's bad. And the reality is, like I said, we have to look at how to make them more resilient. Yeah. How can you secure your income that you are making, ensuring that you can continue to provide for your families? And that was my question, because I think we, we just had the conversation last week about the phase out of, of single use plastics. And so the plan is obviously looking at alternatives. If you're talking about a phase out of gill nets, what are the alternatives to the fishermen, yeah. the 83? Who are using? Well, I, I, I think that you have la good alternatives you could do. I mean, you could, like all the ban shrimp trawling, I mean, you could do a, a sona sustainable shrimp fishing with traps. You could look at deep slope fishing. There's a lot of things deep I think. Deep slope that fishing? What's that? Yeah, that's the deep sea fishing. Mm -hmm. We have not been utilizing our deep water stock. Yeah. Right? So. That's and those are higher value fish. Yeah. And those are higher value fish, yeah. yeah. But also, we could also look. At the outside world, for example, I mean, there are places like Canada who has destroyed their fishery with nets, mm -hmm. you know, and they have huge fishing ground, thousands of miles, not a little 200 miles like what we have in Belize. And if they can destroy that, I mean, what's going to happen to us? So is that what you, you, you see? You see what's taking place in yeah. other countries or other parts yeah. of the world that you just don't want us to get there? Yeah. 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 Now. When you talk about, um, and I said it before, you know, the way I and my limited uh, knowledge of fishing, so please correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that a gill net, you put it down um, and, and you go back and check and collect what you've caught, whatever is there, yeah. whatever's supposed to be there and not supposed yeah. to be there, you take out, it's probably dead. Um, what other alternatives are there for the low effort, high yield, as you would get from a gill net? Are there other alternatives or are we at the point where we have to be honest with ourselves that that is not the way of fishing for the future? I think that's, that's it right there. That, that is not the way of fishing for the future. It is the, it is the reality that it's, it's an easy way of fishing but it's a very indiscriminate way of fishing. And what it is is you lay out your net and then you come back and sometimes it's laid out in the night and it's early morning so it's out there for five oh. six 12 hours. 12 hours even before they start pulling it in and again if there is no monitor and i've heard anecdotal yeah. stories where they come upon a gill net and they start pulling it in and it takes 45 minutes to pull it in that's how long it is and again we're talking mm. about because you will have you have restrictions and the law has restrictions yeah. of how long it can be but the reality is is who is monitoring you and who is checking? One of the problems with the net is the fact that if you set a gill net mm -hmm. in the evening and you're going to haul it in the morning, you have to take out your fish three times at night or else they're going to spoil. What do you mm. mean? Yes, they're going to spoil. What do you mean on the gill net itself? Yes. Once they catch in the net, if you set it six o'clock, you got to take out the fish ten o'clock. Then you got to go back and take out the fish two o'clock. And then you got to go back in the morning and get the rest. Or whatever catch from 6 to 2 o'clock, if you leave it, all of that is spoiled. So you lose money? So it's not in your interest to have it spoiled? Mm -hmm. No, but the point is the people that come across the border, they are primarily fishing for sharks. Uh, so they don't care what, what dead is in the net because that attract the shark to the net. Mm. So, they just, like so all that fish just spoil every time they set their net because they want the shark that is a big high commodity value over in their country. You know, so, I mean, so that's one of the bad practices that's been happening. Does that happen with local fishers? We, do we well, also do that? Some thing of thing? them does happen because some shark. people, just for laziness, they go back and they, yeah. they don't haul in it till the morning. Yeah. What percentage of we the locals would you see? We did see that image say, from right? Lighthouse Shark. I remember that, that one is and still then there's in another, my mind. There's another issue. We yeah. have a closed season for shark yeah. in Belize, but we don't have a closed season for net. Mm. <laughs> so how are you going to set a net and tell a shark? Not to swim in it when there's a closed season. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of little things that you have to look at. There's different fishing methods yeah. for sharks. There is long lines mm -hmm. and there is nets. So it depends yeah. on the methodology. So and it varies. The long line would catch individual mm -hmm. large sharks. The net catch from the babies right up to the big ones. With a seasonal, with a, with a, with a seasonal rotation, four gill nets, 
help and have the same impact in the short term? You, you said that there well, were no, there's no well, season for I know that the, 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 the Belizean fishing, fishing guys, they primarily using it when the mackerel they run, usually when they call front time. When they not, they blow the mackerel and start to migrate and start to run. Okay. And then, then guys, they catch a little bit of mackerel and stuff with their net. Right? So they don't use it all they year They don't use round. it all year round because also they do lobster and they might do... Yeah, know, or fishermen things. rotate depending rotate. on what's, yeah. Yeah. what's in season. But the the foreigners. Foreigners, they let's all, it's not all year round. Illegal fishing. Illegal and illegal. Yeah. <laughs> Now, how there, there was the establishment of the Gillnet Task Force, which is a multi-agency um, approach in trying to resolve this issue. Um, is the current proposal to move towards the phase out and ban? I mean, this is a consensus from everyone from the task force? Well, I don't know if it's everyone from the task force, but I know from the coalition, mm -hmm. we are looking at that a phase out ban because we are trying to look at something else for our fishermen that use gillnet yeah. to be able to do to make up that gap mm -hmm. in their income mm -hmm. yeah Can and the, and the current request for uh feedback uh what does that require i mean what are you trying to get is the government trying to get a sense of what people want is is that what's happening i guess so i think in terms of perspective uh the form is uh it requires some information so they ask you if you know if you're a fisher if you're just a citizen in what capacity you're you know responding to the to the kind of questionnaire um, for you to cite research or articles you know kind of what helped inform your opinion or position on this yeah. um, and then overall your overall position um, the process is a little bit onerous in the sense that you do have to fill it out and return it physically um, so it's not something that you can do electronically and submit and give an email which um, which is interesting, but I do think it's um, a good step in terms of, you know, kind of a, a democratic process, so to speak, is that you're open to yeah. hearing feedback from, um, you know, from the citizenry. Um, so it's an opportunity to get the feedback in there, you know, your opinion, your position, um, but it does require some legwork in terms of actually handing it back in. I guess it shows your commitment to yes. what you believe uh, if, when you make that additional step. Um, and... You know, as I said before, we've had fishermen on the show who've spoken about the fact that they don't want, they feel, they you follow the regulations, they feel the regulations are enough. How do you speak to the public and have them understand that, I mean, do you agree with their perspective at all? Is there anything about what they're saying that you're in agreement with? Well, the only thing I'm not in agreement with is the fact that they think that you can set a, a net and does not catch, have bycatch. Yeah. Mm and there's no way you can set a net and only catch what Your you want to catch. Target. Yeah. I, what I, would a ban on gill net change? I think it will help a lot of the other individual fishermen that use hook and line mm -hmm. to have a better sustainable livelihood. So you're saying the 30% of the fishermen who are using gill net affect the livelihood it, of not, the remainder. Not, it's like 3% use oh, gillnet, not yeah. 30. 83, sorry. It's, it's like 3%. 3%. Yeah. So you're saying mm. their use of gillnets are affecting the wider, wider population of fishermen. Yeah. I mean, right, the St. George's Key used to go there and when mackerel run, you fill your boat with hook and line. No, you can't catch none because guys have been there at night, set their net, and destroy the whole school. So 97% mm. of the industry dozen of the fishers don't use gillnets. Don't use gillnets. 97%. As per the statistics from As the fisheries. Yes. Although, and, we, and although yeah. Mr. Fairweather indicated that there are some people he knows who yes. has that aren't on so that. Might be like that are not yeah. licensed. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to ask this in terms of it's, it's the, the culture of Belize is a very difficult one in terms of consultation. I think what is happening now is a consultative process. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a tendency of <coughs> not wanting to participate and then complaining afterwards. Yeah. And the more difficult the consultative process is in terms of what it involves. If it involves you going somewhere, if it involves you um, doing certain things, the less likely you're going to get a true participation from the citizenry. My question is, one, who is the consultation specifically targeting? Is it targeting fishers? And if it is targeting fisher folk, then is this the appropriate tool? Because I maybe have a little prejudice in terms of yeah. what my mental picture mm -hmm. is of yeah. 
the demands of a fisher. They're probably out there for long hours, they come in there tired, you know, um, are they able to sit down and fill out a form and send it back in? Take it in. And take it in. Yeah. Is, is, it, is, it, is it a process which is friendly to fisher folk, if that is the target group? And if it's for the general population, how can the general population contribute um, to a specific industry in a specialized way? Well, I will leave Mr. Fairweather to maybe offer insight in <laughs> well, terms of whether it's friendly for a, for a fisher, but in well, terms of general population, um, yes, I think it's, it's relevant, and I think everyone should be absolutely relevant. You eat fish, it's relevant mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. You know, if your family is a fisher, um, you know, if you depend on these resources, yes, it's absolutely relevant to you, and you should be interested. Um, I'm if you're in tourism and you've seen say, how yeah. it's impacted your industry, it's relevant. To it, you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The supply chain is, is, is pretty, pretty important, and we all play a role in it. Um, and so I think even in terms of filling it out, I, again, I say maybe a little bit onerous, but it's important. It's, it's not exactly, um, I wouldn't classify it as user friendly, um, but I would say that, you know, it, it's, it's valid. It's, it's yeah. there for you to, to, to fill out, to access. Uh, we've shared it um, in terms of trying to make it available for yeah. download so you'd be able to utilize it. We can help you turn it back in if you need help in terms of doing that. Um, but it's absolutely relevant. I just want to clarify, food? though, it's I not that you put out the no. consultation, the government did. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. What percentage of official folk have you seen participating so far? Can you give an indication as to how well, many how many submissions you've had so far? Well, we're not collecting the not the, collecting. the sheets. Yeah, so it's the government. yeah, the government yeah. is the you have task any force. Idea? So we're not sure. No. Well, if the process is working properly. The way we do it at the BFF is that we hand out the forms Physical, printed to form. each association. And then they would follow their farms and then we hand it back into the And you take it in for and, them. And in your association, what has been the return? Has have a lot of Well they they colleagues. have not handed in as yet. They've they not handed supposed it in. To, the Friday is a deadline, so we're supposed to get it sometime before when Friday. When did you hand them out? Well, it was like two weeks ago <laughs> we got the farm, so Yeah. I don't know how come it they What is your expectation so late. in terms of the participation of well, I think that the, the people that don't rely on Gilnet will be the ones that are for the ban, and the fishers that do rely on Gilnet, they will probably support the ban. Yeah. I mean, support the, the keeping of Gilnet. We've done a rough survey out at Lighthouse in that it's not a gear that's used there. It's there is primarily free diving for Kongs and Lobster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what we have found is that the majority um, can te attest that it is destructive yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then there is a, a margin that a slim margin that says well we'll keep our options open yeah. about a 10 15 percent that says we'll keep our options open and with the proper regulations they think it can work yeah. and I think that is fair to say because when you look at any kind of change dynamics that's yeah. about the percentage about 10 to 15 percent mm -hmm. will be your naysayers and then you'll have that middle ground uh, but considering the, the small volume of people who actually are, are using yeah. it, right, the, the reality of it is less than 100 compared to well, 2,900. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, also, you have to look at the <laughs> fact that when Gilnet first started using in Belize, there were a lot of fishermen that went into Gilnet. Yeah. And because of the unsustainable bycatch, yeah. A lot of us gave it up. I used to use Gilded. A lot of men used to use A lot of fishermen yeah. used to use Gilded. Yeah. They gave it up because they, back when there was abundance, you catch a lot of stuff that you had to throw away. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. saw that it was not. So you saw that firsthand, that first bycatch catch yeah. is. Yeah. It, it reminds me so much of the trawling conversation. Mm -hmm. I yeah. knew there were, there were a couple of people too who were standing up against trawling. And at that time, there were foreigners. I think it was Jamaicans mm -hmm. coming in and doing it in the South as well. Um, from what I hear from you, uh, it seems to be the most achievable target in terms of moving forward in sustainable fishing. Is, is that what, what this phase out and ban is? That we, if we can get this out of the way, we can focus on being able to tackle some of the larger issues, protecting our conch, because oh. yeah. we don't ever want yeah. to not have conch available in Belize. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is that yeah. what it is? Uh, I think it definitely will allow the fishery department to focus more on, on, on monitoring like, you know, conks and stuff like that. Yeah. Because that would take a lot less, um, you know, enforcement. Yeah. In terms of the culture of um, uh, fishing, the, you, you're pointing to other sustainable um, catching meth methods, 
like the using the uh, the deep sea catch. I think you yeah, referred deep to sea it. Long line. Um, does that require different equipment? Yes. Because yes. I see yes. a lot of or f yeah. the fishermen that I it's see it's when I go yeah. and buy it, fish it, it are these little dories or these yeah. little yeah. skips. Yeah, yeah but that it will fish. also require different boats also. Yeah. Different yeah. equipment, more expensive equipment. More expensive boat. And uh, more gas usage. Mm -hmm. Or diesel. Or diesel. So it, it will have two impacts if we were to shift that way. Yeah. One, a shift in what we look on our plate because we're looking at steaks now because the these are bigger fishes. Fish, yeah. But it also looks at it also will look at a <coughs> price change. Because it can't well, be the same amount of money if I just paddle in my dory. As right now the price the price the I, d I do deep sea fishing and I sell my catch for seven dollars a pound wholesale. Yeah. What, what what accounts for the ability to have the same price? What accounts for the ability? Yes. It's a diesel engine. Gas mm. gas engine burn a lot more fuel than diesel. Nice. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's a diversif it's, I yeah. mean, we've been talking about this a long time. It's I, a diversification I, I of our of our sources. Yeah. And from yeah. twenty sixteen yes. the min the fisheries department has been promoting yeah. diversification. Yeah. And that is why when we did rolling out of managed mm -hmm. access, the zone that is the deep sea is it's for open. everybody, it's open for everybody to utilize. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. reality is, is it has a cost, and we want. I don't want. To, I want to be sure that that is mentioned. There is yeah. a cost. Phasing out is not going to be. Oh, put down your yeah. net and you are, yeah, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. No, it requires effort. It requires more time because, as Mr. Fairweather has indicated, putting on a net and then hauling it in. If you're doing it for fishing, obviously there's multiple hauls. Yeah. But if you're doing it, it. it the reality, if you're doing it for shark or another product, then it's one time you're pulling that in and you're getting what you want yeah. out of it, but yeah. at the consequence of, of a lot of bycatch. Yeah. So it is going to require a mental change. It's going to require assistance in transitioning. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. going to be easy because it's going to require you going. So if you only are used to going so far from the coast and now i have to tell you i have to go farther yeah. that's the reality of the situation unfortunately um we have to allow the stocks inshore to kind of recoup yeah. a little mm. bit before we can start saying but hand line there are people mm. in in toledo who have transitioned yes. into the hand line mm. and they say i catch what i need i can catch what i can sell and then I can move forward, go to the but market. How many gillnet users with the, with are with exclusive with gillnet yeah, users? But with the with the hand line, you can uh -huh. also release the undersize okay. right away. If you yeah. catch something that's too small, you throw it yeah. back in. Yeah. You understand? Know, but with the net, when it's dead, it's dead. Once it's caught, it's caught. Yeah. 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 But but how many gillnet users only use gillnets? Well, from from what you know, from Belizean fishers, they don't. All of them do other things. So they already yeah. have other other, other alternatives. Other, other alternatives. It's just investing yeah. more time in because those. Because it, it's it's the gillnet is seasonal. Yeah. The yeah. fish run at a certain time of year. That's when they use the net. Okay. And then you know a lot of them do lobster and a lot of them also dive for conch and yeah. stuff like yeah. that. So. And it's looking at what they need, you know, you know, resources for our capital for. Because a lot of the consultations that we've done with some of the fishing community have indicated that, you know, some of them, yes, want to continue fishing. They're looking at alternative options, gear. Um, but some of them also want simple things like training, you know, and things like financial literacy. You know, mm -hmm. there are things they want to explore, uh, other ideas they want to have, you know, or they also seek some type of... Um, you know, I, I don't want to say like a natural end to the process, but many of them too, they realize they've been in fishing for many years. They've seen, you know, the landscape, change, the environment yeah. change, and they don't necessarily want the same type of uh, scenario for their children. So they're looking at other things and other ways. And so, you know, in terms of even with the Coalition of Sustainable Fisheries, I think what we've been looking at is very much informed by the fishers themselves. So um, understanding, you know, what their needs are and seeing how we can best uh, be prepared to help those who are licensed to but also in, in terms of, of diversification it's a lot of fishermen are stuck in one area because it's more expensive to get into a yeah. mm -hmm. like deep sea mm -hmm. fishing i yeah. mean i have spent over a hundred thousand dollars to do mm. deep sea fishing yep. you know so how many other fisher folk would have that amount of money well i know in the other in yeah. Caribbean well, countries I did it they over do like a coalition years, for their right? deep yeah, sea i buy too. my stuff a little bit a little time bit and time. but it's it's like that i mean for you to give up what you're doing now and get into something else yeah. it's, it's a big overhead cost so 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 it keeps you right in a little yeah 
Let me, and, and, and I want to I wanna ensure that people know that they can be a part of the process, as, yes. as Kevin. You know, this is yeah. an important part of um, us being able to contribute to the wider yes. conversation, even if you never went out fishing, you eat fish, yeah. or you know somebody in the tourism industry, or a friend that has a restaurant that sells fish at least, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see the impact uh, yes. directly. So how do people participate and say how they feel about the potential ban? Well, we have the form available for download. If you go to belize.oceana.org, you can download the form, fill it out. Uh, we have our field representatives located in each district. They can pick it up from you or yeah. you can let us know we can get it. If you wanted to email the form back to us, we can print it um, and submit it for you. We can help make it a little bit easier for you to do that. But we have tried to make the form available by putting it on the website um, and I believe yeah on the website so you can download it from there the deadline is this Friday so yeah. we encourage everyone who like you said eats fish likes fish yeah. um, knows someone who's involved in fishing and tourism uh, yeah. you know well I think that also that the government kind of like fail a lot in a sense that I mean they know this thing has been going on for years and they could have had maybe some radio talk show where people could call in the public will call in and voice their opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see how they do it with the IC, do you think everybody involved, right? So, <laughs> I mean, they could have did that with the Gilnet for years. Yeah. But I don't know what happened. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming in and reminding us that this is an important issue that is ongoing and that the consultation period is open, but it ends on Friday. Friday. So you can weigh in on the discussion. Uh, the form is available on Oceana's website and you can be able to share your thoughts. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Okay, thank, you. thank you too. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to representatives of the Belize City Council about their upcoming super sale.